This is Floss Weekly. I'm Doc Searles. This week, Catherine Druckmann joins me in talking to Dave Siffrey, who's an old friend who knows a monstrous amount of stuff about AI, and he's enthusiastic about it. He's very much a techno-optimist. Maybe not quite a techno-utopian. I was a real techno-utopian in the last millennium. Um, some of that turned out. <laughs> some of it didn't. Um, some of it we're still waiting for. The same thing is happening with AI right now, only in a much shorter time frame. It'll be different this afternoon than it was this morning. And Dave is all over this stuff. He's got this great history that goes way back in the open source world, but the future is what really matters on this one. And if you want to know about it, this is the show to watch. That's coming up next. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Floss Weekly, episode 736, recorded Wednesday, June 14th, 2023. Don't fear the AI. This episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Fastmail. Reclaim your privacy, boost productivity, and make email yours with Fastmail. Try it now, free for 30 days at fastmail.com slash twit. Hello again, everybody, everywhere. I am Doc Searles. This is Floss Weekly. And this week I'm joined by Catherine Druckmann herself. Um, Myself. There she is in her, in her looking slightly tilted room, actually. <laughs> and, yeah. So how are you doing today? I'm doing see- all right. Is that a Star uh, Wars shirt or? That's, that- yeah, you know, that's basically my wardrobe. It's like nerd conference shirts and Star Wars shirts. It's kind of, I, or roller I, derby shirts. That's the other. That's the other genre. Um, yeah, it is. I'm pretty excited about this, though. I, I think we're going to have a good conversation based I, on the the back channel. <laughs> yeah, based on the, is the back channel already waking up? I haven't looked at her. Oh no, channel. I just mean you know the, the back channel in the, the back global channel. sense. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. It's um. <laughs> yeah, I'm just looking at it. It's already distracting me. Um, yeah. So d- did you know, Dave, at, at all when we were Liddish journaling? No, I don't think so. Yeah, yeah I don't think I did. Um, there's there's uh, D- Dave and I have a long history um, together and else <laughs> and otherwise. And and his bio is so long, actually, I'm just going to I'm just going to go ahead and get into it because I want to maximize the hour we've got. Um, the, the the guest today is Dave Siffrey. Um uh, I've known Dave since uh, I think the last millennium, whenever it was that uh, he created Linux Care. And I don't know what it was exactly, but Dave was like, as, um, I was a, er, still early on as an editor with Linux Journal. And and Dave was my docent inside the Linux world more than anybody else. He was extraordinarily helpful. Um, and the idea behind Linux Care was that you know, you needed basically tech support for doing Linux. And it, and that was, I think it was a fairly successful company. And he'll tell me later exactly how successful it was. Um, uh, but he went on from there to do um, Sputnik, which is an early um, uh, Wi-Fi hotspot thing. Um, and most significantly, he helped me out when I was doing a report in Linux Journal, a long one on blogs. And I was a pretty um, alpha blogger at that time. <laughs> I, I was I once met um, uh, Robin Williams actually just by chance at a uh, at a show at one of the conferences, and and somebody introduces me to Robin and says, "Doc here is um, is one of the top five bloggers in the world," and I said, "More like one of the top fifteen, but most of the others are duplicates." And then I got into this wild kind of jam with Robin Williams. It was, it was bizarre, but anyway, it's big on blogging and, and Dave created overnight something that turned out to be Technorati and Technorati was a search engine just for blogs and just for RSS feeds, just for syndicated feeds. And that was at a time when if you, if you had a website and you changed it, Google would f- index it like, Weeks or a month later, you know, there was not the web was not a live thing. Um, and what Dave helped do with Technorati, he looked at the live web. And in fact, my older son had called it the live web. And I have since. And um, uh, and the learnings coming out of Technorati were just absolutely gigantic. And since then, um, Dave's done 
a zillion different things um, having to do with photography, with um, with mapping and with maps, with travel. Um, um, more recently with the Anti-Defamation League, um, uh, he led the Center for Technology and Society there, I guess. I'm looking at a very long paragraph of all this stuff he's done. Anyway, it's it's gigantic. But lately, it's a lot of AI. I had like a two and a half hour conversation with Dave uh-huh. that wasn't finished. So I decided we have to have it on the air here. So Dave, welcome to the show. Doc, you are way too kind. Uh, and it's <laughs> such a wonderful thing to see you, to, you know, to hang out again. Catherine, it's such a pleasure, um, you know, and really looking forward to our conversation today. And I'll say, you know, you, First of all, to say that I was your docent through the blogosphere is an enormous, an enormous compliment, sir. Um, the 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 fact of the matter is that you know, Doc, uh, as one of the co-authors of the Clue Train Manifesto, you were and still are in many ways the spiritual inspiration for so much of what we're talking about today and what we think about in terms of social media and use of attention and you know the live web and communication and people you know the democratization of communication <laughs> and um you know the so so you know you're you're the inspiration and you know what's so much fun is to get a call out of the blue and this is really what happened out of the blue it's like the universe opens and there's doc on the phone and it's not i haven't we haven't probably talked in at least a year yeah and there are those people in your life that you know you kind of do the little dance and then there are others where you just step in and it's as if you're in the middle of doing a samba together and that's what i've always loved about our relationship is that right at the moment of saying hello we immediately are dancing again and and you know those those people are few and far between well that that's extraordinarily flattering and i and i appreciate it but i i it, it's funny i've been I have so many friends that I got to know through my many years at Linux Journal, but um, nobody's been more helpful than you have, man. You know, just uh, staying on the case. Why don't we d- just jump to that for a second? I mean, w- um, this is an open source show. What are, what are your learnings in a sort of general way about open source, which I, you may have been one of the ones that decided in 1998, we're going to call this thing open source and not just free software. Well, I think that was Eric Raymond who actually originally came up with the term, but, um, you know, this was during that time period when, I mean, uh, our tide myself and, and David LeDuc had, had built a company called Linux care. And, um, we were kind of at the center of a lot of what was going on in the community, at least in, in the Bay Area Linux users group here in San Francisco. And, um, you know, I, I got to sit on the original board of the Linux Foundation when uh, when uh, Mad Dog Hall and and some other folks had uh, had gotten it going. So I was incredibly privileged to be sitting at the at the start of it all. And it's you know, it's only succeeded beyond everyone's wildest dreams. Uh, and even on the desktop, if you think about it in terms of, you know, some of the tablets and Chromebooks and so on, right, which we all thought wasn't going to happen or we were concerned mm-hmm. might not happen. But, mm-hmm. you know, the fact that uh, not only as a server operating system, um, but also as, uh, you know, as a mobile operating system and to see open source and the principles behind collaboration and the freedom of being able to not be chained into an abusive codependent relationship with your software vendor and how incredible the the work uh, and this gift economy that started well I mean it, it started back in the free software days uh, but to see it continue to to grow and to become such an accepted part of the way that we do business today. I mean, look at, gosh, look at Microsoft right now, you know, supporting open source in in ways that, you know, we would have never imagined. And that old quote of, you know, first they laugh at you and they fight you. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So first they laugh at you, then they make fun of you. First they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you. 
and then <laughs> then you win. <laughs> yeah, we we kept talking about Gandhi Con three, and we're all in Gandhi Con three, and it turned out we're in Gandhi Con four. Um, I, I know Catherine has some thoughts, but um, first I want to say because we're going to get around to AI, I was trying to remember. Okay, am I sure it was Christine Peterson? So who named open source? So I asked Perplexity.ai, which actually gives you sources, which I like. It's a real simple AI, and it did say Christine Peterson coined the term, and then. And at the group that I was not part of, but it was in Palo Alto in early 98, um, it was Todd Anderson, Larry Augustine, John Hall, Mad Dog, Sam Ackman, Michael Tiemann, and Eric Raymond. And Eric Raymond argued for making it. And I'm pretty sure Bruce Perrins is there too, but I'm not absolutely sure. I should probably ask it as a follow-up question. But I wanted to give credit to Christine Peterson because she's been a guest on this show. <laughs> That's the main reason I wanted to do Well, that. I stand corrected. Yeah. I'm always glad to, to be corrected on that. And it's important that the people who, all of the people who are involved are, yeah. uh, are clearly identified. <laughs> I, was, I was just a promoter, actually, at that, at that stage, which I did. So, Catherine, you had a, anything? In, yeah, in, yeah. I'm just... Yeah. Having been around in the early days of open source, as we just discussed, you know, in, in the in the first we, we fight you <laughs> time period, right? I just kind of wonder now that I like to say we've won, you know, we won. It's it's not even it's not really a conversation. And we could we could again have an entire episode about this, I think, about you know how a Linux journal tried to evolve in a world where Linux was ubiquitous. Um but now, okay, so now that we've won, and, and there are other conversations to be had, obviously, around open source, but but effectively, almost all, I mean, most software today is basically open source, or at least a good chunk of it is. Maybe there's some secret sauce on top of it, um, but it, it's open source, so we've won. So so I kind of, so I know we're, we're going to get into open source, uh, uh, sorry, um, AI and open source, but... I'm wondering, like, where where do you see the struggle today? Like, where is that? Where, what are we fighting for today? Yeah, uh, honestly, I would dispute that m most software is open source. I, I I think that there's plenty of software that's still proprietary and that's you know well that's well used and you know th there's a software it is but it's using that's based around it and that's you know like but it's using like the good a, a good choice. portion of it is open source no matter what it is. There Maybe is the a, end result is proprietary, but it's you, there's open source in there somewhere. And they're benefiting sure. from the open source economy and the open source ecosystem. No question. And other free licenses uh, as well, right? Uh, you know, that, yeah. that, you know, thinking about, uh, you know, the Apache license, the MIT license, and, you know, all of the other variants that allow people to incorporate code that has been written and many eyeballs have checked and to you know incorporate that into other products is another really interesting uh, uh, corollary. Uh, and, and to that, I, I totally agree. Um, and I think that uh, like the fact that there is a, a strong and powerful ecosystem means that there's lots of different viewpoints and you know we can let the marketplace and people's personal value systems also, you know, determine how they're going to be licensing the work that they do and, and how they get paid. Right. So I, I'm not religious in the sense of, you know, all things must be free and all, you know, all things must be open sure. because that also creates some pretty strange incentive systems um, around, for example, well, how do people make salaries, right? And so, you know, again, I'm not disagreeing that there aren't open source companies. Uh, you know, Linux Care, Linux Care was an open source company, right? We we realized that there was an incredible value in technical support, in education, in professional services, in certification and lab testing, uh, and providing that kind of value uh, validation uh, to. Uh, to people who wanted to use and learn more and stay up to date on what was going on uh, around software. And it's not only about a butt per seat license that is the only way of being able to, you know, build really powerful uh, and strong ecosystems. Yeah, so uh, I want to get into a little bit more of how that plays with open source. But first, I have to let everybody know about Club Twit. Um, joining Club Twit is another great way to support the Twit network. As a member, you get access to ad-free versions of all the shows on Twit, as well as other great benefits. There's a bonus Twit Plus feed, which includes footage and discussions that didn't make the final show edit. 
as well as bonus shows we've started, such as Hands on Mac, Hands on Windows, Ask Me Anything. Take that again. Ask Me Anythings and Fireside Chats with some of your favorite Twit guests and co-hosts. As Floss Weekly listeners, you may be interested in checking out another Club Twit exclusive show, The Untitled Linux Show, that's hosted by Jonathan Bennett, one of our great co-hosts. So sign up for Club Twit. It's just seven dollars a month. Head over to Club Twit. Have one take one again. Head over to twit.tv slash club twit and join today. We thank you for your support. So, Dave, you gave us a long paragraph of links and other things there. And and I'd like to kind of pivot off one of the last things we talked about. Um when we were just talking, just the two of us on the phone, <laughs> we had an audience of zero. Um, and, and that's, that's personal AI. One of the, uh, one of the um, links you had was to a video. And even though it was full of techie stuff, I could follow it and I th- could see how I could install an AI that I could use, that I could train on my own data um, not just on stuff that's out there in the world, but on my contacts, calendars, my email, whatever other things that are in data readable form. Um, and I started imagining all kinds of ways that I could change my life with this. I mean, even with, I mean, when I saw Apple's new headset, we won't go into what that is, but the fact that it has two cameras on it that can stereoscopically look at stuff and you could put an AI on the back end of that. And I can say, I look at my bookshelves over here. It would recognize the spines of all those books. Um, there'd be some database, I suppose, that it could be trained on that would know that that's a blood song and that's Dutch and there's Ogilvy on advertising and, uh, you know, Tony Pierce's how to blog over there. Um, and you could look the clock at the clock that's in the middle of that and tell me what the t- time it was done and probably could do a timestamp there anyway. But I could start imagining all kinds of things I could do with that. You know, I live in three places. I have books in all three places. Which ones are where? You know, mm-hmm. those are, and I could, I could have a query. You know, where is uh, Bruce Schneier's data in Goliath? Is it in Santa Barbara, New York, or Bloomington, Indiana? I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't keep track of that. So t- tell us a little bit about where, where we are with that and where we could go with it, especially for, I think most of our audience are DIY types, right? What can I do with this myself? Ooh, well, you know, let's be clear. So it's June 14th, 2023. <laughs> the reason why I make sure to really talk about the date is because the rate of change of what is going on in the world of artificial intelligence has been accelerating and accelerating rapidly. And right now there, there will be an S curve right now. It's not showing any signs of letting up. Uh, just being able to keep up with things that are going on in just a piece of that world, let's call it the world of generative artificial intelligence. And we can talk a little bit more about what does that mean um, as opposed to say interpretive or filtering artificial intelligence that the world of generative AI uh, has just been exploding. uh, And it's really come into consciousness uh, I think in the larger world context, when OpenAI uh, came out with ChatGPT and ChatGPT4, um, which was, um, you know, not too long ago, uh, you know, I think beginning of the year. And uh, for those of you, if it, just in case there's anybody who's been living under a rock, uh, you, know, you should go and check it out. You can go and play with it for free uh, over at the OpenAI uh, site. Uh, important to note that that is not open source software, but you can use it for free uh, and they have a subscription product. Um, I, I don't work for OpenAI and, you know, other than uh, I, I'm, I'm a fascinated user. The, the thing that's been so incredibly interesting is that based on some relatively simple premises, we've now been able to build and train a bunch of what are called large language models or LLMs um, that uh, have gotten progressively more powerful in interpreting natural language and being able to do some really interesting things with natural language and use it to both say translate from language to language, 
That was one of the ways that uh, you can use it to generate some interesting value, but also to be able to translate from, say, text into an image or from text into most more recently videos. Uh, these are now starting to become more popular, generating short videos. Um, and, you know, there are, interestingly, uh, some pretty powerful open source uh, or, you know, op the source available and model weights available models that are out there um, that are, are close in capabilities to the bleeding edge of what's going on in the marketplace today. And that's incredibly powerful, which means that folks who are in the DIY space, people who want to be able to play around with and train these models on your own data, you can actually do so and do so relatively cheaply. So is, is there one particular, okay, if you, if you want to, roll your own? Where do you start? What I would do is I would go to Hugging Face. Uh, that's probably yeah. the best aggregator for all of this. And, and actually, Hugging Face, great example of an open source company. Um, so it's huggingface.co. They uh, started out really as a project where they were bringing in all of these different interfaces uh, and different models that were being made available and providing a way for a standardized way and a standardized set of APIs and some software to be able to interact with those models, to train them, and then to use them as well. And uh, what often happens is the, the really expensive part of building, uh, of using these models is actually doing the original training. So getting billions and billions of documents, and they're trained usually off of enormous corpora, like uh, the entire works of, you know, all of scholarly articles that people have been able to scour off of the web or the entire, as much of the internet as possible, uh, you know, images uh, from a variety of different places. And again, the training data uh, is often then, uh, that's the expensive part, is to actually train these models. And then the models are released in a pre-trained state so that you could actually test their capabilities. They and, and again, we can get all technical and nerdy and talk about like, how does that actually work? What is the reinforcement learning process that it uses and so on? But I assume that that's a little bit too technical perhaps for what most of the folks here are gonna be interested in. If so, we can totally rabbit hole there. But what, what most people then do is they'll download one of the latest models and then they will upload it into a GPU, because usually these are very, very big models. And you can go and you know rent a GPU, whether it's on AWS or it's Azure or it's Google Cloud or you know, a variety of other services. And, and then they will bring in their own data and fine tune it, right? So they can fine tune and essentially teach these existing models who you could almost think of it as like it's a it's a child it understands english it can you know basically answer questions it can do some pretty interesting emergent things but then you start training it on your own data and now all of a sudden it can start answering questions about your data and what moves on from there is you'll want to use reinforcement learning as you increase the amount of data or as, as you have feedback, you can also have the models learn from that reinforcement, um, whether it's uh, human like human based reinforcement learning, like you, you're actually getting responses where humans say, I like that answer, I didn't like that answer. And then that goes back into the optimization function that retrains these models. Um, or it can even be using synthetic data that's actually created by the AI itself or by other using other AIs to actually query the model and then give back reinforcement. So you're actually seeing AIs being used to create more data that then is being used to train and reinforce 
other AIs as well. So it's it's starting to get very interesting because of the fact that they can understand and they speak in the same kind of language that humans use. So something that you said you know a second ago, which is the expense of training large language models, it's tremendous. Like I've seen a lot of numbers thrown around, but none of them are small, right? Millions, the, the minimum. Um, but there's another idea um, that I've also seen discussed that I find very interesting and something that Doc and I talk a lot about, which is kind of personal AI, but it, that translates really to smaller models, right? Uh, more curated data sets, uh, more specialized functionality, maybe iterative training where you can, you know, in a more open ecosystem, you can build on all of these things and let them build on each other. Um, but especially when you consider having your own da data to train a, per a personal model, um, and then the smaller versus larger model, I see that as um, potentially more valuable because one of my biggest concerns, again, with the large data set, the, the you know, training on the entire internet or, or something like that, you get a lot of garbage. There's a lot of garbage on the internet. So garbage in, garbage out, right? But when you, when you, when you narrow it a bit and have a, and have a, a more curated uh, set, I, 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 I think that's very interesting. And I wondered where you see um, what you're excited about? Where do you see that going? Like, you know, wh what applications would you would you like to see happen, especially when it when, when it's personal? It's a great question. We run into a tiny bit of technical question here when that is built around how these large language models are actually created. So I just want to get that out of the way so that we don't have any confusion with our listeners. What you're describing is right in that, yeah, there's a whole lot of garbage that's out there on the internet. Uh, and in fact, there are safety questions and other types of issues mm -hmm. around bias and, and uh, uh, all, all the rest that comes from when you start using data that is of, let's just say, questionable provenance. Um, and, and that brings up a whole bunch of risks that we can talk about. But these the basic training of these large language models that enable them to even understand what is uh, the next word in a sentence or to be able to output something that looks like uh, iambic pentameter when you ask it to write a poem or when you tell it ask it to tell you a funny joke right these are these are all things that come out of that base level of training that to your point uh, is often tens, if not hundreds of millions of dollars uh, in cost uh, that take months to be able to train and fine tune. What I'm talking about, though, is the models that you'll end up seeing on Hugging Face. These are already pre-trained models. Somebody has done the work um, and in some cases they've already taken a previously pre-trained model, like in fact, the, the one that a lot of people in the open source community use is one that was originally uh, created by Facebook called Llama. Uh, you see a lot of the work that happened here and there was a, a bit of a, a leak of the actual weights of the model that then got out into the open source community and, and has now sort of taken off like wildfire. And then on top of that, what then people will do is at a much, much, much lower cost is they will then improve that base model. And here we're talking about in the dozens to hundreds of dollars of GPU time right. to be able to train those models on, say, an entire software corpus. Right. So, a, you know, a big piece of software is too much for one of these models to actually keep in its attention span right now. And I'm going to talk about attention and context windows in, in a minute, because that's the third way of dealing with these things. Um, but basically, these models are set up in such a way that they can take a certain amount of information in and based on the way that they've been trained and fine tuned can now either answer questions or do code generation or do image generation or what, what have you with that kind of pre-training uh, or fine tuning is the, the word that's used in the community, the phrase. And now once those have been fine tuned, so let's say you are, uh, you've got a company and you have an entire Q and A system, right? Where you've got, you know, all of your support tickets, right? You would want to actually fine tune 
a pre-existing open source model on say, let's say I wanted to create something uh, uh, that was imitate uh, Doc Searle's blog post. Well, guess what? There are a ton of Doc Searle's written articles <laughs> right now, obviously, if I had Doc's permission, because I wouldn't want to violate, you know, his intellectual <laughs> property here. But, you know, let's say we wanted to create something that impersonated Doc's voice. So what we it, voice in the sense of the way that he writes. Um, what we could do is we would fine tune one of these existing open source models with all of the postings that Doc has ever done and collect all of that. And then when we ask it to write a new article doc, it'll write in a way that's similar to the way that you write. It'll refer to the kinds of things that you might have referred to in the past. It will predict what you would have said without, you know, any knowledge or pre, uh, 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 any checking in with you today live, right? It could, it could essentially imitate you based on your writings. Now that's using a fine tuning model when you have a large corpus of say corporate data, or let's say it's just, I wanted to look at my calendar. My calendar is way too big to be able to fit into just a query in chat GPT. So I would need to fine tune the model. But here's what's really interesting is that the models also, as they are improving in size and capability, are also improving in the amount of information that you can give it and that it can pay attention to at any one given time. So this was just news yesterday. OpenAI originally has their, their GPT uh, 3.5 turbo model, was able to take uh, about 4,000 tokens, which is somewhere around six or 7,000 words. And now it's actually jumped, right? So they've doubled that yesterday. And so now you can probably get about 15,000 words. So that might be a, a few of docs, you know, best of blog posts. And then you can actually query and answer, have it answer questions or have it generate text that's similar to say those three or four or five articles. So part of this comes down to what is the kind of information that you're trying to be able to understand and query or summarize? Uh, and as these context windows are growing, uh, there's another there's another proprietary company uh, called Anthropic uh, that has a model called Claude that has a hundred thousand tokens. And in fact, they were able to put in the entire text of F. Scott Fitzgerald's The Great Gatsby. Uh, for example, without doing any fine tuning whatsoever, they were able to give it the full text of the novel and say, write an epilogue. And it actually did a half decent job at writing an interesting epilogue for The Great Gatsby. I I, I read that epilogue. I thought it was actually terrible. <laughs> I'm not a writer, so, and, you know. And, and, you and, was, and on top of that, I, I, just, I just asked uh, ChatGPT, because it has been trained on my stuff, <laughs> you know, to, you know mm -hmm. to write me three right, paragraphs on travel in the style of Doc Searles. And it was so not in my style. <laughs> you know, and no, no sentences began with and there were no M dashes. <laughs> you know, it was like, and but it gets me to a, a, a different topic, which is, um, and you brought it up earlier of, of, of consciousness and, and what, you know, I mean, I forget the guy's name, but the guy who left Google because he said, well, this thing is sentient now. It's going to be sentient. You know, we're all going to we're all going to have to go to Mars because this is over. <laughs> um, and and D Doug Rushkoff, uh, who you may know, and I, 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 I know him. He's a brilliant guy. Um, he did a, uh, a I think it was a book about hanging out with a bunch of billionaires and all they want to do is like go to New Zealand when the apocalypse comes and hide out. And, and they've sort of lost track of their rationality in a way. Um, but I, I have, so I, I raised the topic with you in the, when, in our earlier conversation about the difference between explicit and tacit knowledge. And, and these are, we, in the human sense, in the human sense, um, the explicit is everything one can say. The tacit is what you know that turns into what you say, and most of it never does. You know, you know how to ride a bike, you know how to slam a hammer, you know how to drive, and this all happens at a tacit level. 
And in a tacit way, it's not even a level. I mean, we are basically tacit knowers of what we do in the world. And, and we're not really very good at the explicit stuff. I mean, we, you know, the phone number we were told three minutes ago, we don't remember, um, you know, the, uh, you know, we, we might be able, you know, an exceptional person might know pi to 3000 decimals, but that's nothing compared to what a machine can know, right? The fact that a machine can beat a, a chess master or a go master is really no surprise. It's something that a machine ought to be better at. But the nature of knowledge itself is, is a human term. Even knowledge itself is, we sort of project this on a machine. A machine has knowledge. It doesn't. It has data. And all that data is explicit, and it does nothing but explicit stuff. But you argued that, no, wait a minute, it maybe can do some tacit stuff. It may have tacit knowledge of things. So give us, give us a, if you can, an explanation of how, how machines can have tacit knowledge, which is, to me, like the most human form of knowledge. Hmm. And by the way, I think you can have tacit knowledge without having consciousness. Uh, I, I, I think oh, yeah. the consciousness issue is something that is a whole other area that we could easily spend a week on. Right. Alone. And people can sleepwalk and not know they did it. Right. That's not conscious, but they're, yeah. And, and also I want to be very careful in that, you know, I, I there are things that I, um, I would consider myself, uh, as, as a reasonable, knowledgeable person around. And then there are others that I'm, you know, far more speculative and I want to be careful around the areas where I don't want to be misleading. And, and the fact that there are lots of people who have been thinking about these things for a lot longer, um, uh, and, and I would not do them justice in some sense, but the, the, the issues that you bring up here, like, well, so what does it mean when we're talking about tacit knowledge, right? Because you actually said, well, hit a hammer. You said, ride a bicycle. Actually, I had to learn how to hit a hammer. I had to learn how to ride a bicycle. It just, they happened when I was a child. They happened during a period of time when, you know, I started with a little rubber hammer though, and beep, boop, beep, boop, beep, boop, you know, and I, someone showed me how to hold that hammer and someone showed me how to bang it into something that looked like a, a peg. And, you know, I learned that if I hit my finger, it would hurt. Um, you know, when I got on the bicycle, it took a little while and there were some painful experiences of falling down before being able to start to get my balance. And today it feels like tacit knowledge because it's unconscious, because it feels like it's just part of the environment. And I think this comes back to looking at some of these large language models as they've been developing over the years and watching what I would call emergent effects that happen as these models have gotten larger, both in terms of the total amount of connectivity and connections inside of the model itself, as well as the amount of training data that those models have been trained upon. And what we start to see is that they originally just to even be able to predict the next word in a sentence with a reasonable amount of accuracy was sort of considered surprising. This was, uh, you know, the original insight behind what's called the transformers model, which is what a lot of the work behind large language models are, are based around today, this idea of what they call a transformer. Um, and that at first, you started just by being able to train it to, if I say a, cer a certain number of words, it's gonna predict the next word or the next two words, the next three words, and be able to get it right. And that was sort of looked a lot like magic. Well, now I can ask it a question and it has seen answers that are similar or it has a level of dimensionality that is so large. We're talking about trillions of different uh, pieces of data that they have been trained upon and these weights have been calculated against. Um, and so no one knows exactly where and how it makes that decision of 
you know, when when I ask it to uh, say, write me something in the style of William Shakespeare, it happens to write in something that looks an awful lot like iambic pentameter and uses the language of William Shakespeare. Perhaps it hasn't, by the way, it, it hasn't been trained on quite as much of Doc Scholes's writing as it has on William Shakespeare's writing uh, and analysis over time. So if you explicitly fine tune it and you say, I actually want you to really rely on this corpus of data that happens to be Doc Searle's writing, I guarantee you it's going to do a much better job at imitating you. It's not going to be perfect. And in fact, what will happen is it's still trying to use this same basic idea of predict the next word that comes that would help to answer the objective function, this thing that you've given it, right? The, the question that you're, that you're giving it. Um, back to how does that relate to tacit data? So imagine if the, if the core question of a transformer model is, how can I reliably predict the next word that's coming? Well, you got to know a heck of a lot about the world in order to be able to do that reliably well. And so embedded deep inside of the way that these large language models work with their billions of parameters and their trillions of pieces of uh, data is what effectively becomes not just a model for language, but also what has started to become a tacit understanding of a model for the world. And now you, you can argue and many people have, well, but there's no clear semantic knowledge that, you know, that points to, you know, this and this means that, and that means that, um, that's true. But because human beings have evolved a way of communicating tacit knowledge to each other, the machines are just learning from how humans have communicated that tacit knowledge. And perhaps you could say they're just imitating that. Right now, I think that's an, this is why consciousness and the ability to output what looks like tacit knowledge, they don't necessarily have to correlate with each other. But the point is, if it looks like a duck and it smells like a duck and it quacks like a duck, well, you know, could you actually start to use it or could you actually, you know, maybe it's a duck, right? Well, it's not quite a duck though, because it hallucinates and it gets a whole bunch of things wrong, right? And so on and so forth. And, and that's true. And so how do you think about that? Well, human beings hallucinate. Human beings, you know, we, we just call that creativity, right? Or we'll call that dreaming, or we'll call that forgetting, or we'll call that, you know, misremembering. And so while I'm not trying to assert that the way that LLMs are built are the same way that human beings think, um, it's a really, really interesting analog into looking at human cognition and the knowledge certainly that you get just by being able to ask these kinds of models questions uh, and hear back what they say, um, combined with, in my opinion, um, a bunch of guardrails that you can perhaps, you know, like, can you create logical structures? Can you create structures where there are things like chain of thought, chain, chains of thought or asking the model to explain itself and explain its reasoning, for example, that have actually been shown to improve the output of these models themselves. So what's really exciting here is to watch that as the models have been growing and been getting trained further, not only are they more versatile towards fine tuning, but that the emergent effects that come from these models training and from their size have been surprising in their capabilities. So, uh, boy, we have uh, questions piling up <laughs> on our back channel, but first I'll have to let everybody know, that this episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Fastmail. Make email work for you with Fastmail. Customize your workflow with colors, custom swipes, night mode, and more. Fastmail now has quick settings. From the quick settings menu, you can easily choose a new theme, switch between light mode and dark mode, and change your text size without leaving the Fastmail screen you're looking at. Quick settings will also offer options related to the Fastmail screen you're viewing. 
You can generate a new masked email address, show or hide your reading pane, switch between folders and labels, and more. You can choose to auto-save contacts or choose to show public images of senders from external services like Gravatar. Set default reminders for events, change how invitations are handled, or turn notifications for calendar alerts on and off. Now add or buy a domain through FastMail, and they will set all the records up for you so it works immediately. FastMail gives you the ability to send and receive emails from your own domain and manage multiple email addresses in one space, which helps keep you organized and protects your personal data. For over 20 years, FastMail has been a leader in email privacy. The FastMail team believes in working for customers as people to be cared for, not products to be exploited. Advertisers are left out, putting you at the center. You pay for free email with your privacy at FastMail. Your data stays yours with better productivity features for as little as $3 a month. FastMail has better spam filters too, and absolutely no ads. And privacy isn't all you get with FastMail. Superior productivity tools with scheduled send, snooze, folders, labels, search bar, etc., plus Keep track of all the important details in your life easily with FastMail's powerful sidebar. It works with password managers like Bitwarden and 1Password to make it easy for you to create unique passwords for every account and safely store them on your device. It is great on desktop and mobile, especially when you download the FastMail app to get the most out of your email. It's easy to download your old data and import it into your new FastMail inbox. FastMail is moving email forward with their new internet standards and open source innovations that power many email services other than their own. So don't get left behind by substandard email providers. Reclaim your privacy and boost productivity with FastMail. Try it now free for 30 days at fastmail.com slash twit. That's fastmail.com slash twit. So Catherine, we're Dave has been so optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> I know. So let's let's turn it the other way. <laughs> is is pessimistic. So take that. It is one. quite a bit. Yeah. Well, so so right before you know we we paused here, you mentioned guardrails, right? Because there has been some concerning activity, let's call it, surrounding AI and and most recently, I can think of one example where uh, a eating an eating disorder helpline had to end a an automated chat program after something like five days because it started giving very alarming and damaging advice to people. Um, so that's one. There's been many others, but if I start listing them, well, it'll take all day. Um, but all of that said, AI isn't new, right? This is it's not new. We, there was a little bit of there was a bit of uh, a bit of a uh, Push back and some headlines a couple of years ago about Clearview AI, for example, right? You know, mm. uh, AI driven facial recognition. Mm-hmm. Well, there's been a lot of creepy AI <laughs> in the in recent years, but I don't think we've seen quite the pushback and sounding of alarms that we're seeing now with regard to AI. Especially, you know, you, you talk about the 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 former Googler and 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 the that all of that po- posting and whatnot. Um, and what I'm wondering, where I'm going with this is, what was the point of inflection? Something happened where we're more concerned now. What, what do you think that was? And why weren't we before? It's a great question. Um, I think partly the these issues are not new. Um, and and I, I would perhaps classify them into a number of different categories. Everything ranging from bias and misuse of biased data in the training of these mm-hmm. kinds of uh, systems. So everything ranging from how you know Amazon tried using this to actually uh, rank resumes, uh, and yeah, that is a were, scary story. <laughs> yeah, and they they were because the original intent was we want it. We have so many people who apply to be engineers. We want to get a more diverse engineering crowd here at Amazon. How do we actually you know? just get out of this huge flood uh, mm-hmm. that, you know, and, and it makes sense, right? Um, but yet the the data that, you know, that ends up coming through, they had to stop the program because they found that it was, uh, 
that the AI was not actually looking at the qualities of the people. They were just right. looking at, you know, certain types of names of people. Right. Right. That and, to me uh, goes back to garbage in, garbage out, actually. It's if you train it on biased data, if you get a group of resumes that you, you know, if, if let's say 80% of your workforce, your technical workforce right now is male and you train it on that, on those resumes. Well, in order to win, let's say the AI is just going to, it, it is going to, it amplifies the bias because again, that's what it knows. And that's, and it, it seems to me that it's going to distill it down and pick and highlight the biases to, to, uh, to sort of uh, continue the, the cycle of bias. Yeah, but I think ahead. what's also interesting is that you say, OK, well, you know, what if we took names out? What if we were able to, um, you know, to make some changes into the data that we're actually inputting into the AI? Right. So I think that there is some some room for um, for opportunities here. And, and for example, the, the EU is just coming out with some very interesting laws and regulations around looking carefully about the bias that can often be an unintended effect. I, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm sure that that was not an intentional oh, yeah, error. Not, yeah. And, mm -hmm. and so, um, you know, it's important to, um, to, to look very carefully though at some of these unintended effects and how they can have impacts on, uh, on communities. Uh, or, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, lending, bank lending, Right. Or, you know, mm -hmm. looking at historical patterns uh, of discrimination and that that can get baked into the data itself. So so you're absolutely right, Catherine. And, and I think that that's a really critical um, analysis that needs to happen before you start making automated decisions based on these kinds of analyses that occur. Um, I think, secondly, there's a question of so what if you have a bad actor, right? So here, th these are good actors, right? Like Amazon absolutely was looking at this and as a way to like help increase, mm -hmm. you know, uh, diversity and, and so on. But now then you have a second set of threats that are, I would call the bad actor problem, right? Or the, the weaponization of artificial intelligence, whether that's in the political sphere, uh, as we start have already started to see people who are using generative AI to be able to, you know, what what people used to do with just Photoshop, right? But now they're there, you can make it sound like with deep fakes and voices, you can you can also now have AIs creating data that then is getting spouted by social media bots that are, you know, promoting certain kinds of viewpoints and, you know, certain kind of polarization, right? So this is the, you know, the old, uh, well, what if we put a, uh, we had a, a death weapon, right? That, you know, AIs could actually get pointed at and, you know, now you've got a problem where who decides what the AI is going to be used for. So that's a second set of threats that I think is very real and we need to be looking at very carefully. And then there's a third set of threats, which is I would call the super intelligence set. Um, and that's actually relatively new, at least in in the, the, the more general conversation, um, which is so as AIs are getting more and more capable and you can now use AIs to actually help build better AI systems or at least more capable AI systems. Maybe I'll take the, the qualitative judgment of whether it's better or worse out of it. Um, that that only accelerates the growth, right? So when you look at what happened with, say, um, chess and with Go as systems, they started out by training them against the best human players and playing human matches, but then it very quickly realized that what we actually need to do is just teach it the rules of chess or the rules of Go and then let it play against itself over and over and over again. And pretty quickly, it actually not only learned all of the rules, it learned how to win and lose, but it actually started playing, you know, relatively quickly, better than many of the human players and finding new strategies. Um, but there were also these, what, you know, they would call uh, these use cases where, you know, humans could, could give it a move that it had never seen before and it would immediately fall apart, right? Um, so on the super intelligence scale, you, you start to get into the questions of, well, as these systems get more and more capable, at what point will they be 
able to become conscious? At what point will they be able to start being self-directed? And is there, uh, are they aligned with what the humans, you know, human race actually is trying to get done, right? And, and that's where you start getting into some of these very big existential questions around these very large models that um, research labs are, are working on today um, that, you know, that has led to people like Jeffrey Hinton leaving Google and saying, hey, I think that we need to have a pause here. Or Sam Altman, who is, the, you know, the head of OpenAI, saying we need to um, get really serious because there is the chance of unintended consequences because of the competitive nature of this field where, you know, Microsoft wants to get ahead of Google, wants to get ahead of Meta and, you know, they all want to get ahead of China. And, you know, everybody is worried about, um, you know, the other. And so we're not thinking carefully about what some of the safety parameters are. And, and I think that all of these risks are, are very real and they need to be thought carefully through and mitigated against in a way that, uh, you know, we still have time. Um, but this is an area where, you know, that promise, that area of excitement and promise that I've been talking about, you know, needs to be effectively attenuated against some of these risks. Um, we have a, a back channel question uh, that's about mental mental models. And we've had mental models for AI for a long time. And like Big Blue came out of that. And and what is the difference now that is it LLMs? Is it it, it seems to me that's what it is, but I'm not sure. What's it what Yeah, I think that I would argue that it's the difference between uh, formally, this sort of symbolic logic model of artificial intelligence where, you know, you had to quantify a coherent model of the world. And, and this is where things like mathematics, you know, is incredibly useful and you can actually have provable theorems. Um, but human language doesn't work that way. And so having LLMs now the APIs of human beings as we communicate with one another is now something that we can talk to computers in and to some degree of correctness, get a reasonable response back from those computers and that those computers are now able to start to communicate with us in a way that we communicate with each other. And I think that that has brought about you know, first of all, an increase in the capability and the complexity of these models, um, but it also opens up some of these risks. Well, this is great. I can see we really are pretty much close to out of time here. So um, <laughs> anything we haven't touched on that you'd like to touch on very quickly, and I'll get to the final two trivial questions. Gosh, um, first of all, I, I think that um, there are, the, there's just so much that we could be talking about. Doc. Like we we didn't even really scratch the surface on some of the, for example, task and goal generated um, AI systems that take a combination of LLMs plus symbolic logic together. Um, what I would call, you know, originally we think about the to do list, right? As the application, well, you know, could you actually build AI systems that actually have the ability to make a do list? So you ask it to actually go out and do something and it figures out the goal of how to actually do something and then goes and executes it, whether it's browsing the web, you know, uh, going and doing things for you, summarizing articles, writing reports and so on and so forth. Um, and I, where, where I get excited is the opportunity to use both the LLMs for their natural language understanding and tacit knowledge combined with symbolic logic and these new or these mechanisms that we've had for a while around chain of thought, chain of reasoning, mental models, and using those as a way to help provide guardrails um, and also as a way of creating new capabilities where, for example, you if you're having a hallucination, well, if you've got five or six of these models all talking to each other, each with a different instantiation, with a different personality, maybe they can all vote to decide, wait a minute, that that sounds unethical. That sounds like that's not going to be something that, um, you know, is actually true. Where do you find this out on the real world, right? And that they could vote down the hallucinating uh, LLM, right? So, so there's a bunch of very interesting um, research that still remains to be done here that I think is very promising. 
Wow. <laughs> like that, <laughs> then we gave you that one. So final two questions. Um, what are your favorite text editor and scripting language at this point? Oof. Oh, man. Um, well, I, I got to say, I'm a long term Emacs guy. Um, oh. I, I'll still use VI when I have to. Um, and uh, although more and more, I got to say, uh, you know, I've been using, uh, you know, Visual Code Studio uh, for uh, for some of the cool stuff that it brings too. So, um, but, but I'm, I'm like, get me whatever I, whatever is out there. Cool. Did that, uh, that cover scripting language also, or is it, uh, no, we didn't get there. Oh yeah. No. I mean, if you're, if you're playing around in AI, it's gotta be Python. I was going to say, yeah. Python. Okay. <laughs> There's <laughs> Ant with his ring. Um, well, Dave, this has been, I think, the fastest hour we've ever had. <laughs> so, I, think, I thought we were just it, getting started. Yeah. <laughs> so, so much more to cover. Is. So much and more to cover. It's been so exciting to be able to talk with two amazingly wonderful, intelligent folks. And, and I hope <laughs> that this has been uh, just a scratch of the surface. There's so much more to talk about. There is. There is indeed. So thanks a lot for coming on, Dave. We'll have to have you back. Soon. I, mean, I have to say quickly, by the way, a thought I had earlier was, would anybody start a monthly magazine about AI? <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I know a great group of like, people. <laughs> it's almost an absurd question. It would, it would have to be daily. And by the way, there are people who are putting out daily. There's so much. There's so much on it right now. You're, you're touching on some during the show. Anyway, great to have you on, Dave. Come back soon. Thanks so much for having me. So, Catherine, that was <laughs> that was great. But yeah, I thought, well, OK, now that we've warmed up, we'll get to the, the main show. And then. <laughs> yeah, I know. And I, I have a bunch of notes over here. So many open tabs um, uh, for things we haven't touched on. And all of them are, are deep, actually. And I think Dave touched on a lot of those. Yeah. Um, and do we need uh, to do the plugs. What, what do we do now? Yeah, we I need never to remember plugs. how this works. So, yeah. So do your plug. Oh, okay. You got okay. one. Uh, oh, I do. I do. Um, well, I mean, first, you know, Doc and I do another podcast. So if you if you like the Doc and Catherine show, we can hook you up at Reality 2.0. Yeah. But I also, um, I started a podcast in my day job at Intel. So that is, you can find that at open.intel.com. Uh, there is a menu item there for podcast. And hey, that's me. And I have some interesting conversations lately. It's been a lot about security, but uh, spoiler alert, it's probably going to get into some AI stuff because it's such an important conversation. But I hope people will listen. If you just really like the sound of my voice that, you know, there's, <laughs> there's a there's a solution for that. We do. <laughs> Thanks, Ant. <laughs> this is um, this is uh, where um, we I have to where I usually stumble around trying to figure out next week. Well, next week our our because I actually found it and our, our guest is one of our own co-hosts. We're going to start a little series where our different co-hosts you're going to be up for that at one of these points, Catherine. Um, yeah, will be a guest on the show. So the one next week is Dan Lynch. He's in Liverpool. I haven't decided a co-host for the co-host, but that's coming up. Uh, and that's coming up next week. Dan's always great. So. Uh, and and I will be actually in the Twit studio. So for those of you watching, um, I'll I'll sound better. I always sound better there. Everybody sounds better there. But I'll also look better too if you're if you happen to be watching. But I'll I'm be sure in about looking better, sir. For that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like friend Leibowitz said once: you know, look in the mirror. It only gets worse. <laughs> you know, you're never going to look better than you look right now. <laughs> Refuse to accept that. Although Dave, I, I guess they look great. <laughs> yeah, thanks, man. Okay, we'll see you guys next week. Take it easy. Hey, we should talk Linux. It's the operating system that runs the internet, a bunch of game consoles, cell phones, and maybe even the machine on your desk. But you already knew all that. What you may not know is that Twit now has a show dedicated to it, the Untitled Linux Show. Whether you're a Linux pro, a burgeoning sysadmin, or just curious what the big deal is, you should join us on the Club Twit Discord every Saturday afternoon for news, analysis, and tips to sharpen your Linux skills. And then make sure you subscribe to the Club Twit exclusive Untitled Linux Show. Wait, you're not a Club Twit member yet? Well, go to twit.tv slash club twit and sign up. 
Hope to see you there. 